Not that long ago, our churches were full. We met our budget fairly easily. And there was a minister for every pulpit in the country. We were at the top of our game. And we did not have to worry about the welfare of a denomination, not at all. But at one point, we start to notice that the next generation stopped to show up on Sunday morning, but we were not really afraid. We assume they will come back when they want to be married or have their child baptized. Unfortunately, it did not necessarily happen this way. And then another generation left and another one. And one day it seems that we all wake up in panic saying, we ought to do something about this. So we should explain to them why it's important to do what we do exactly the same way we've done it the last 30 years. Why this program or committee have to survive. Why this frame on this wall cannot be moved. We said we want advertisement in shiny magazine to tell them they are wrong. They will never be happy if they don't show up on church on Sunday morning. And if needed, if needed, we are even ready to make some change, like replacing the organ by guitars, uh, consider a large screen in our sanctuary, or any stunt that would attract their attention. In short, let us offer them essentially more of the same, and let's see if we can obtain a different results. Believe it or not, a similar reflection, a similar conversation occurred 27 centuries ago in a land far away from ours in a culture significantly different from our own. The Israelite experienced a great era of prosperity during the reigns of Kings uh, David and Solomon. The economy was good, uh, the neighbors stayed on their side of the border, and God protect them. What else can you ask for? So there were no incentive to change. So they retreat in a classic case of if it's ain't broken, don't touch anything, don't change anything. However, life told us that nothing in this world remained the same forever. The Syrian came and they invaded the Northern Kingdom. The people of Jerusalem were not necessarily happy about it, but they did not worry too much because that was not them. But the Assyrians began to walk toward Jerusalem. And suddenly the people woke up and felt the urgency to address the situation. And is, it is in this context that the prophet Micah appeared. We, we don't know much about this man, except that he came from a small town of Moresheth, which was approximately 20 miles uh, southwest of uh, Jerusalem. In today's term, Micah could be compared to a country boy who went up to the capital, Jerusalem, and he was profoundly troubled uh, because what he saw. The prophets strongly rebuked the corruption and the abuse of the ruling elite. The poor were exploited, the press dispossessed. Justice was, re was reserved for the powerful, for the wealthy. And according to Micah, his nation deserved nothing else than be wiped out if they continue on this path. So the people react. They say, tell us, prophet, what simple trick do you have? What simple fix do you suggest to assure our survival? What should we do to earn God's protection? What does the Lord require of us? Maybe our religious rituals and act of praises have not been serious enough or in sufficient quantity 
Maybe an increase in the volume, in the quality of the sacrifices would do the trick. Maybe offering something like a calf's a year old would work. If it's not enough, uh, let us sacrifice a thousand of rams. Or, or, or let's have 10,000 rivers of oil. Oh, okay, final offer. We can fo follow the example of our neighbors, the other tribes, and sacrifice our firstborn. Would that be enough for you, God? Would you be happy with this? Yesterday as today, God does not desire our over-the-top liturgical practices and massive offering that are essentially more of the same from individuals who are convinced that faithfulness and righteousness can be bought. The prophet Micah invites God people to look at the situation from a different angle and challenge everyone to think in, in terms of general principle instead of specific actions. What does the Lord record of us? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. That's it. Instead of being obsessed with a long list of rules and interdictions, we are called to be more concerned about the way we behave with one another in our daily living. We are asked to aim for a kind of justice that would permit all to function as part of the community and rectify the inequity of our society that allows some people to be oppressed to the point they are deprived of their basic needs. We are invited to be committed to a life that is governed by the principle of mutual respect and to extend this kindness to our neighbors in the same way God unconditionally expresses kindness to us. We are encouraged to spend time walking and journeying with God and see our world as God does to see it. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with our God. These are beautiful words, could be a wonderful slogan, easy to remember but often very difficult to put in practice for most of us. Because we're set, we're asked to set in motion a radical reorientation of our lives that goes beyond the exterior and outward rituals. We are called to an inner transformation that synchronizes our words, our action with our faith. Saying the right prayers on Sunday morning becomes hollow if we turn away from those who are suffering on Wednesday. Giving a huge bag of old clothes does not mean much if we don't petition our leaders to lift up the neediest, the poorest, the most vulnerable in our community. To do justice is not rewarding good and punishing evil but ensuring everyone has what they need. To love kindness is not limited to the welfare of the people we meet every day, but also to those we will never meet, but they will be affected by our decision. We do at the grocery store, at the mall, at the car dealership. To walk humbly with God has little to do with attendance and committee work but rather willingness to be surprised and challenged by the most unlikely presence of you in this world. To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God is often difficult for the most of us because it requires letting go sometimes rules and practices of religion we have sometimes followed since our youth. But if transformation is hard, nothing is as painful as staying stuck at the same place forever. And the good news is we all have this capacity to change. We're not the same than when we were six, for example. 
We have grown, we have learned, we have matured, we have evolved. We have opened our minds to consider what was impossible not so long ago, or understand what might we consider to be right that was not maybe right or wrong. In the same way, we have the capacity to understand that God is not limited to certain strict observance, ritual, or even building as beautiful they are. We can discover new ways to be the church of God outside old tradition and outside our zones of comfort. We can listen to the prophets who challenge our expectations and help us to see our world from a different angle. We can create a balance between personal and common needs and desires. We can rearrange our lives so oppression and discrimination are reduced. We can share our time and resources generously with our friend and people that we will never meet. We can dare to be relevant for those who still search the presence of God outside our churches. We can discover our true nature by being connected to God, to one another, and also to ourselves. As I often say, if I add perfect marketing and communication plan to fill our churches week after week, well, I would have written a book and I will be a millionaire by now. Since it's not the case, uh, I'm here. But the more I think about it, the more we think about it, maybe we don't have to re reinvent the wheel. The prophet Micah reminds us to stop living in the past, repeating the same mistakes over and again, and stop bringing our stuff in order to believe we will be loved by God. No, God is interested in each and every one of us and how we answer this call to live a meaningful life with the members of our church and those who do not come to, to live according to what the Lord requires to do is maybe, after all, the most powerful statement we can do in our society today. And for this, thanks be to God and amen.